True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to a bonus episode in which I have a super interesting interview for you. All of the murder cases I cover on the podcast have one thing in common. As part of the death investigation, the victim is autopsied. The autopsy is a procedure that is widely covered in a range of television programs. But when those programs are fictionalised, we never really see the truth. I think that we all have certain preconceived ideas about what an autopsy entails and what pathologists do. The term pathologist is what we primarily use in South Africa to refer to a physician who performs autopsies. Overseas, that job is sometimes referred to as a coroner or a medical examiner, although it must be noted that the role of such a person differs slightly from country to country. In South Africa, in cases of unnatural death, A forensic pathologist is the person who will conduct an autopsy on the victim to determine, amongst other things, cause of death and whether the death can in fact be deemed a homicide as opposed to a suicide or death by accident. Jonathan Bull Publishers has just published the most phenomenal book written by Ryan Blumenthal. Ryan Blumenthal is a forensic pathologist based in South Africa. He's published widely in the field of electrocution, suicide, and other areas involving the pathology of trauma. His chief mission in life is to help advance forensic pathology services, both nationally and internationally. His book Autopsy, Life in the Trenches with a Forensic Pathologist in Africa, is one of the most eye-opening books that I've read in this genre for a very long time. It not only opens us up to the truth about forensic pathology in general, but helps us to understand how different the practice is in Africa, and particularly in South Africa, compared to the rest of the world. I had the great pleasure of chatting to Ryan Blumenthal, and today you get to hear that interview too. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. You start your book autopsy with a chapter entitled, So You Want to Be a Forensic Pathologist. You explain that in order to become a forensic pathologist, you need a basic medical degree, which takes six years, then two years of internship, one of community service, and then another four years to specialise. Now, this might seem daunting, but it really is such an important role that I can fully understand the length of study required. I know you explain your path to forensic pathology in the book, But for our listeners, could you briefly explain why you chose to go into this field rather than just continuing with ordinary medicine? Right. I do address this in depth in the book. There were several critical incidents which uh, led me to the path of forensic pathology. One was at school being the victim of bullies. You know, so I think that is a critical theme in my book. I hate bullies, and I'm a very big one for anti-bullying behavior. So, um, yeah, that's a major theme in my book. The second one was, I I was a, a medical doctor, and I realized that my patients were not that innocent. You know, I went into medicine to help people, and they were not that innocent. Look, there are victims in clinical medicine that get sick for no reason you know of their own however the great majority of patients in medicine are due to 
their own bad choices in life. They would, you know, drink, smoke excessively, sleep around, travel excessively fast. And, you know, uh, and then I do, you know, treat them now. And, you know, I, I was doing damage control. I wasn't doing any healing. And to me, these were not real victims. And then there was one or two incidents which are critically discussed in the book, which sent me over the edge, so to speak. And I realized I cannot do this anymore. I need to go where I feel more comfortable. And so it was an evolution into uh, forensic pathology. I think that's a very interesting evolution. And you address in the book how you found it so difficult to deal with these people who'd essentially cause their own illnesses, and after you'd healed them, would likely go back to the same behavior that had caused their illnesses to begin with. Yeah, in the book, I don't want to give too much away about the book. I'd like your readers to purchase it, obviously, but there was one specific incident in Britain with one particular patient that I believe was the final straw for me. It was an elderly gentleman who was having an asthma attack and woke me up at two in the morning. I had to walk through snow, it was freezing cold. You know, uh, kept me and all the nursing staff very busy for hours and hours. And afterwards, you know, I said to him just casually, sir, do you smoke? And this man quite arrogantly responded, 50 fags a day, laddie, 50 fags a day. And I responded, you know, sir, you could uh, be wasting our time, you know, with maybe an expletive word in between hour and time and um, the sisters took great exception to my um, tone and and I think that was the final straw I just realized I wasn't actually saving lives I was just doing damage control and this is not what I wanted to do in life Mm. I think that's something that we as patients don't often consider is that although most of us are very grateful for the medical care we receive We don't think about how frustrated medical professionals must feel having to constantly treat people who wouldn't be in their care if it wasn't for the choices they made. I discuss the the concept of luck egalitarianism in my book. You know, sometimes in life we end up in the situations we are due to our own bad choices, and sometimes we end up where we are due to no fault of our own. So, for example, someone may be born with a genetic abnormality due to no fault of their own. However, some person may end up in this situation due to gambling, smoking, drinking, etc. And if you have limited resources, you know, um, and you have to treat one of the two, would you have some type of judgment in your mind as to who that treatment should go to? And, you know, as medical doctors, we're trained to treat everyone the same and equally and, and justly. But, you know, luck egalitarianism is a concept that needs to be discussed. You also mentioned that the course is highly competitive and structured to weed out the weak. What kind of person, personality-wise, would you say is suited to forensic pathology? Okay, that is an excellent question. Thank you for that. So I always say to prospective candidates that they have to thoroughly interrogate their motives, why they want to do this. It is almost like running a comrade's marathon. You know, why do you want to do it? Is it ego? Is it because it's a personal goal of yours? You know, why do you want to do this? It's like before embarking on a PhD, like what is your motive? Do you really want to add new knowledge to mankind? Or is it a personal goal for yourself? Do you want to do a PhD? Is it ego? I mean, what is your driver? Because after your 9,000th or 15,000th autopsy, when you are quite tired late in the race you know you've got to call out the things in your mind that keeps you going so you want someone with endurance and it must at the end of the day be professionalism so you know we don't want people that are doing it for ego or the wrong reasons you know my personal reasons were i cannot handle injustice and that's what keeps me going so but um, you know we get People applying for forensics because they think it's not medicine. You know, they're not, they didn't get into dermatology, for example, or ophthalmology, and now they're trying to get into 
forensic pathology. You know, we don't want someone like that. You know, and they, they, we want real people with real skin in the game, heart in the game, soul in the game. We want people that in it for the long run. Also, why must I waste my time teaching someone for four years and giving them all my best and then they're just going to drop out the field and do something else? You know, it's a waste of time and resources. So we want to try and choose someone that really has um, the right stuff, for lack of a better word. And I think that your reason for wanting to enter this field in terms of wanting to fight injustice probably leads into one of the other things that I found interesting about your book. And that was your emphasis on each of your cases being a human being, which was really refreshing to me. I would think that it would be far easier on an emotional level to try and not see them as a person, so to speak. Do you think that having this view makes you better at your job or more determined to find justice or resolve cases? You have to treat the body with respect and out of necessity. These were living humans with families and hopes and dreams, etc. You know, and the way people treat the dead gives a huge reflection on the society one lives in. Um, you know, as I said in my book, there are some places in Africa where a body will get run over in a pedestrian vehicle accident and no one even picks that body up. It almost becomes like roadkill. You know, how one uh, processes the dead. You, you can tell a lot about a country by examining its mortuaries and its casualty departments. You get a, a sense of a country by how it treats its dead. Th this to me is critical. I must say that, and it's probably quite naive of me, I was shocked when I read that in your book that in some countries they don't even collect the bodies of pedestrian fatalities. And there's countries in Africa, um, I also touch in my book about the, you know, the 30th of August, which is the International Day of the Disappeared. Do you, do you recall that? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, you know, to be a forensic pathologist also means to work independently, outside of all government agents. We don't want any influence. We just want to work where we want to work. You know, we should almost be a public entity um, away from everyone. Because if you work in health, then if, if someone dies in the health system, there's perceived bias, you know, um, because you think it's a colleague. And if you work um, under the police, then that would be difficult also, because if you have a police killing, then you could have an, a sense of bias. So once you, Forensic pathologists should always be totally independent with no interference from any agency. We just want to do our work and find the truth. That's all we want to do. So the best would be a ring fest public entity or a totally independent entity with no uh, political or other interference. That, that would be the ultimate system. Because there are forensic pathologists in the rest of the world that have disappeared because they found something contrary to their authority and then they have this international day of the disappeared you know because sometimes these people go missing and that is another thing that i certainly didn't realize that there are places in the world where people will actually go to the lengths of getting rid of the person tasked with performing the autopsy in order to cover up a crime uh, look we do deal with what is known as hot potato cases you know, and once again, it's the public's perception. Some cases to them seem more important or relevant than other cases. And in my book, I discuss distributive justice. And I go into the chapter discussing Thomas and Gucci, whom I've met twice, by the way, once at the age of 91 and once at the age of 92. He did the autopsy on Marilyn Monroe and Robert Kennedy and Sharon Tate, etc. And I, you know, everyone is absolutely fascinated. He was the coroner to the stars. Uh, he was the chief medical examiner of uh, Las Vegas. And, you know, the public are fascinated by deaths of celebrities and, you know, which is a common thing to consider. You know, how would you do the autopsy on a Michael Jackson or an Amy Winehouse or the president of a country? You know, then how would you do the autopsy on a Boomerlard, for example? Now, what happens if I were to tell you that 
oftentimes we get unidentified bodies and then that person turns out later to be a person of um, importance or a VIP in the eyes of the public. We've had cases where we found a body buried and then later it turned out to be the CEO of a large European company. So every single case has to be handled the same. You know, we uh, sometimes have a, a trick question for our final medical forensic candidates. The question goes as follows. You have a famous person. How do you do the autopsy? And the correct answer is you do the autopsy like any other autopsy. I think that's a comforting thought for the public because there are so many inequities in so many other areas that it's good to know that at least when an autopsy is done, it doesn't matter who you are. But however, the sad reality is that not all facilities have state-of-the-art equipment. Like, for example, some facilities don't even have basic x-ray machines. And then there are other facilities which do not even have basics like fly screens or, you know, uh, insecticides, basic, you know, oftentimes there's no electricity or running water. And then we have to make a plan, which I discuss in my book, which is about practicing good medicine with peanuts, actually. So you can have a state-of-the-art mortuary with a, a poorly qualified forensic pathologist and you'll get a poor report, or you can have a very poor facility with an excellent forensic pathologist and have a good or adequate report. And at the end of the day, you've got to try and find that balance of excellence, which means practicing good medicine with limited or depleted resources. And that, I think, is what separates us uh, from other places in the world. So you focus quite strongly on that theme in the book about how the practice of pathology is different in Africa to the rest of the world. And then you also talk about how, as forensic pathologists in Africa, you and your colleagues see some uniquely African causes of death. Can you perhaps touch on some of those without giving too much away? The original running title of my book was Death and Adventure in Africa, Tales of an African Forensic Pathologist. And I originally wanted to write my book describing pathognomonically African-related deaths because I wanted to do something unique for our continent. Like, what do we have here that they don't have anywhere else? And then I broke it down into sections. So we've got certain environmental things that are typically African. We've got um, Temek, which is Eldicarb, which is a classic uh, uh, way of killing here in Africa. It's a pesticide. It looks like small pepper-like granules. We've got African wildlife-related deaths. You know, we've got lions here, leopards, antelope. And then we've got even our transport-related deaths. We've got cars hitting hippopotamuses and kudus on the road. So I try to focus on pathognomonically African-related deaths for my book. And I think that makes your book very different from some other resources because I don't think we always realize how some of the things that forensic pathologists see, they might be the only pathologist in the world to see that. Well, necklacing, for example, is a pathognomonically South African uh, way of death. I haven't heard about it in any other country. Oh, really? That's very interesting. I think it's important for everyone to understand the process that's followed in a death investigation from your standpoint. Can you maybe give us a quick rundown of the key points in which you would be involved in a death investigation from the moment a body is discovered? Okay, look, as I say, it's about, it's years and years of study and I do not want to bore your audience with all the details and integrities. Suffice to say that we are an incredibly legislated field and we've got extreme standard operating procedures. There's a concept in my book which I call premature closure. So, for example, if you come to a hanging scene, you can't just say, oh, it's a hanging. Let's just take this body down. Because then you'll miss a staged homicide. So you literally have to go and tick boxes of everything. Like, is this not like that? Is that not like this? You know, is the body suspended fully? Is it, is it touching the ground? Is there a saliva trail? 
you know, is their hair trapped in a knot? And it's a meticulous, thorough examination. You know, to go through the entire protocols here, I don't think we have enough time. So just for us to understand, forensic pathologists do go out to scenes, but surely you wouldn't be going out to the scene of every unnatural death. Just to give you some statistics, so South Africa has a population at the moment of between 56 to 57 million people, and there are currently only 56 um, fully qualified forensic pathologists in the country. We have between 60 to 80,000 unnatural deaths per year, with an average of 72,000 unnatural deaths per year. This means there will be between 72,000 autopsies per year. And there are 56 forensic pathologists. So you can do the maths and you can work out that we cannot go to every single death scene. Um, Every jurisdiction will have about 20 to 30 cases per day. So unfortunately, we have to try and triage which specific cases we can go to. And every single case is discussed with the forensic pathologist on standby. That's tough. It's once again, it's a resource situation. So we we try and foresee uh, which ones could be more difficult than others. But as I said in my book, it is very difficult because sometimes the simplest case can end up incredibly complex. And sometimes the most complex case can end up very simple. Certain cases, we will definitely go to the scene. For example, airplane crashes, deaths in custody, uh, sudden infant death syndromes. You know, certain cases, those cases, we have to go to the scene. But as I say, uh, we'll discuss each case individually. Okay, I understand. So I guess the mortuary staff who actually go to the scene to collect the body would be trained in basic evidence preservation techniques like bagging of hands and that sort of thing. Correct. Great. Thanks for explaining that. I think it's important to understand because we so often take our knowledge from what we see on TV, and I'm guilty of that too. And it's really vital for us to understand that this is not America and that's not always how it works here. Yeah, there's a, a term for this. We call it the CSI effect. I'm sure you've heard the term. So what happens is um, the public sees CSI on TV and they think that a DNA result will be ready like within a day, whereas in reality, it's not so. But the, the flip side of the CSI effect is it raises the bar and the standard because the public now expects a higher standard. So I'm all for the CSI effect. I think it needs to, I think they've done fantastic work uh, in the media and on television programs of educating up and down. The book is filled with fascinating anecdotes from your career, which are always respectfully relayed. And I had countless moments where I had to put the book down and tell my long-suffering husband about my newfound knowledge, which, to his credit, he always reacts to with the appropriate interest. I don't want to give too much away, but please tell us how insects are affected by certain illicit drugs in the body. Okay, I need to temper this by saying that I'm not a forensic entomologist. I'm a mere forensic pathologist. However, being so exposed to insects over the years, uh, one has interactions with them. And uh, I mean, it's part and parcel of your day-to-day work, especially in the summer seasons in Africa when it is incredibly hot. So I start off by talking about flies because everyone wants to know about flies. And I mean, we've got so many stories on flies And flies may be a friend and flies may be a foe. One example where a fly would be a foe, which, you know, I'd be doing my autopsy and then I'd feel a fly hit me on my neck and fall into my surgical scrubs beneath my gown, etc., and buzzing around inside of me. And then you've got to pop everything, take off your gloves, you know, and try and get this fly out that's buzzing inside your shirt, which is quite frustrating at times. They, they find their way in. But flies as a friend, um, they are incredibly fascinating creatures to watch. Firstly, they'll find a body almost within two hours. They alert us to where wounds are on a body. You know, if you get a decomposed body, you get what's known as a maggot mass. So you can find a stab wound from where the flies actually go and sit. So they find open wounds. 
flies can sometimes land on an organ and die, and then they can tell you that this body died of a pesticide poisoning, for example. If someone ingested cocaine, for example, and then dies and, and lies there for a while and becomes decomposed, and there are flies and maggots, these maggots actually become large, and we call them super maggots. They're very hyperactive, and they can jump, and yeah, it's quite, quite fascinating. So watching the flies and how they react and what they do you know, it's part of science, so always good to keep your eyes open. And I think that very complex and diverse nature of the interaction of insects with a crime scene is the reason that there's an entire field of forensic science dedicated to studying those interactions. It is complex. Even, you know, look, mortuary should have good screening and because you can get what is known as blowfly invasion, you know, and sometimes... We've used over the years ultraviolet lights, fly sticky tape, different kinds of smelling substances outside. I'm no expert in this field, but these ultraviolet lights actually kill all other insects in the region and do tremendous environmental damage. You know, and a lot of the entomologists frown upon these ultraviolet lights. They cause tremendous damage. And then we've even had people experiment with cheap African solutions to fly invasions. They came up with Coke bottles with six millimeter holes in them. And they used to fill these um, Coke bottles actually with dead fish because flies actually seem to prefer dead fish to rotting meat, fascinatingly enough. We've tried everything over the years to try and uh, curb uh, what we call blowfly invasion. It's, It's a fascinating topic and a super speciality in and of itself. You mentioned in the book that in South Africa, next of kin may not refuse an autopsy in unnatural deaths. And you preface this with the word sadly. I wanted to understand why you feel that policy should perhaps be different. Do you think that there are situations in which an autopsy is unnecessary or more traumatic to the family? Well, that is an excellent question and one often gets religious objection to autopsies. You know, certain faiths prohibit uh, autopsies. However, it is the law of the land. So um, we've even had cases of incredibly religious people that, uh, you know, do not want to have an autopsy. But we need that autopsy, firstly, for example, to remove a bullet, to catch the person that shot this person. There's no other way other than an autopsy to remove a bullet. And uh, number two is, you know, insurance companies will not pay out until they see an autopsy report. You know, in certain countries of the world now, they're trying to get away from the autopsy. They're doing what's known as post-mortem, non-invasive virtual autopsy, for example, in Geneva, where they're trying to get away from the medieval process that is the autopsy. Um, however, we're, we're not there yet, um, I must say. And there's nothing, it's the biggest procedure in medicine, it's the cheapest procedure in medicine. It gives you most of the answers that you need to know. And it's it's still the gold standard, an autopsy, to find the truth. I guess in these situations, families will need to find the balance between respecting their religious views for how a body should be dealt with after death and the fact that justice needs to be served and the autopsy is a necessary part of that. You know, the religious leader should speak to the forensic pathologist. Everything will be done respectfully and necessarily and with the necessary um, respect. But unfortunately, it's the law of the land. Unnatural deaths require uh, autopsy. Another thing that I found really fascinating is that you admit that you instinctively size people up upon meeting them, according to the criteria that you would look for in an autopsy. I'm guessing that's an automatic response that you really can't control due to the nature of your work and your intense training? Yeah, this is a difficult automatic thing which just happens. I I try and curb my response, but it is very difficult. You know, you see someone and you see something on them. I think this happens for all medical professionals. They see something. And the question is, do you tell them or don't you tell them? You know, and I've had plenty of incidences I've learned to be a bit more tactful in my later ages here, but, you know, maybe I'll go up to them and say, you know, perhaps you should get that seen to, or, you know, perhaps you should consult someone about that. 
I find that maybe is the most tactful way to approach this. But there's definite things you can see on people in society and you just know, yeah, here's trouble looming. You may see something, a sign or something that's, that, that could be of forensic significance. Well, I think that's helpful, especially the way you frame it and it empowers the person to then have whatever it is checked out. Look, I mean, uh, you'll see um, after reading my book, uh, there's a certain type of mindset that develops with regards to low cards principle, which uh, is a major theme in my book. You know, every contact leaves a trace. And whether that contact is overt or covert, it does leave a trace. And I challenge people to try and prove me wrong. But um, if you enter a certain subculture, that subculture is going to leave a trace on you. And you will leave a trace on that subculture. And every contact leaves a trace. It is the most powerful law. Uh, it, it works on so many levels. That is a major theme in my book. You'll see it, it's embedded itself in your thinking now. If you look for it on people and in society, you'll see it constantly at play. Even a basic infection theory is based on low cards principle. A virus spreads like every contact leaves a trace. Yes, and that's something we're dealing with in society right now. So it's extremely relevant. You've already touched on the rates of qualified forensic pathologists as relates to our number of unnatural deaths and our population size. Clearly, this number is nowhere near sufficient. Do you think that there's a way that we can encourage medical students to take their careers down this path so that number can be increased? That is a brilliant question, one in which we are trying to address. I think ideally for a society like ours in South Africa, we need about six forensic pathologists per million population. I think that would be paradise. So there's two questions. Number one is how do you draw people into the field? And number two is how do you stop hemorrhaging forensic pathologists from the field? You know, how do you get them and how do you retain them? And I think it serves for all fields, you know, it works on incentives and etc. I mentioned in the book that we are paid what the clergy gets paid, but without, uh, with probably longer working hours and no promise of eternal salvation at the end. Do you think that's one of the reasons that you're seeing people leaving the profession? Are they going overseas or are they going into other specialities or private practice when they leave the profession? In my 20 years in the field, I've seen a tremendous attrition of forensic pathologists in the field. Some have left to go overseas, some have left to go to anatomical pathology. As I said in my book, one guy even left to go to Britain to pack shelves in a grocery store. I think one of the major benefits of this book is that it takes us into the lives of forensic pathologists. And it's really an eye-opener as to the dangers you face on a daily basis. I, for one, had never thought about an autopsy being a dangerous thing. But one of the lines in your book, which reads as follows, there is nothing more terrifying than the silence of a drop of blood. That really made the danger hit home for me. Can you tell us a bit more about some of the dangers you face on a daily basis? There are multiple risks and hazards in forensic pathology. So there are physical risks, infectious risks. There are mechanical risks. There are psychological risks, you know, constant exposure to death and dying. Um, there are chemical risks. It, it really is a dangerous place. You never know what's going to be on or inside a, a human body. It, it really um, is a dangerous field. Just remember the difference between a surgeon and a forensic pathologist from an occupational health and safety point of view. When you're doing surgery, you want to kind of protect the patient from yourself, you know, from an a, a infectious point of view. And whereas in forensic pathology, you want to protect yourself from the patient. I mean, we've had cases where bodies have been covered in chemicals, you know, you never know what infection there's going to be inside the body. You've had cocked and loaded weapons fall out of bodies. There are super sharp projectiles inside bodies that can go through gloves. There are cases of 
forensic pathologists who've been overcome by gas, for example, by just cutting open the stomach because that person drank potassium cyanide. And when potassium cyanide reacts with HCL in your stomach, it forms hydrogen cyanide gas, which can overcome you. Um, certain places in the world, they even put explosive devices inside bodies to harm medical personnel. So it is by the grace of God you go into that mortuary every single day. There are sharp knives that can cut you. There's slippery surfaces where you can fall. Um, you go into a death scene. You know, our borders are, are patent. So you can have anybody die in a flat and that person may have died from any given infectious disease. And it's really by the grace of God you go into an autopsy, specifically of a sudden unexpected death. You never know what you're going to get. I found it strangely comforting to read that you always approach an unnatural death from the standpoint of it possibly being a murder. Is this a general rule in forensic pathology, or is that just a personal way of working? It is a, it is a mindset for the field, I believe. You know, as I said in the book, it's about puzzle solving. Now, which is more difficult? Telling you, here's a puzzle, solve it, or not knowing whether there's a puzzle there in the first place. So we go into every case with high levels of suspicion. Even the most innocent looking case could be a very crafty homicide. So one needs a high level of suspicion. And I think that's important for the public to understand, because there may be an overlying assumption that homicide is only classed as such if there is some sort of overt sign of foul play. And clearly that's not the case. The opposite is in fact true. I give the example in my book of the perfect murder from the, and it was originally written in the book, The Forensic ABC by Schwar Lopscher and Ulafir, which is a classic text in our country. You know, if you have a relationship and one partner puts extreme demands on the other partner in the way of all spheres of life and feeds them unhealthy food and that partner dies of a myocardial infarction, it seems like a natural death if you do not know the background history. But in fact, this could be a, a homicide. It could be murder. Another part of your job, which I don't think is well known, is how much investigative work you actually do at the scene in terms of observing things that may be important to you in the death investigation and the autopsy. You even take note of how the pets at a property are behaving. Okay, I need to preface this by saying that, you know, it's always a team work. The, my book is dedicated to those practicing forensics in Africa. And this is everyone from the forensic scientists to the police to the photographers. You know, I'm but one small chain in the whole machine. So it's, it's a multidisciplinary uh, process, um, the, the entire investigation. But I, I mean, all I'm talking from is from my personal point of view. It's my personal journey as a forensic pathologist. And the scenes that I've been on uh, have witnessed um, unusual pet behavior. And that, that I addressed in the book. You mentioned how difficult the COVID-19 pandemic has made your job. There is a lot of misinformation going around about how COVID is being handled at an autopsy level and how the cause of death is being determined. Can you clarify for us how such things are being handled during the pandemic from your point of view? Um, look, I can't say more about this than what's in the press already. Suffice to say that we are treating it as a category three pathogen. You know, a category four pathogen would be something like Ebola. So we do take it um, deadly seriously. We do not go into that autopsy without full personal protective equipment. And um, yeah, we're treating it as a category three pathogen. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's so important for us to be getting proper information from actual experts in the field right now, rather than Tom on Facebook. It's just mind blowing the amount of misinformation that's out there right now. A good uh, rule of thumb, you know, what is real science and what is fake science is always look at the source. 
You know, so for example, in our fields, uh, you'll see a theme in my book is good science. Now, what is good science? You know, and I, I discuss statistics in my book. People have no idea about statistics. Um, I, I think I give the example of going to buy a lottery ticket. Your chances of dying on the way to get your lottery ticket from a motor vehicle accident are greater than your chances of winning the lottery. You know, I, I've made that point uh, in my book. And what is good science? And that depends on your your references and your is it peer reviewed? Is it a is it a, uh, a high ISI rated journal, the so called Thomson's Index? You know, who is saying this? On what grounds are they saying this? Do they have an agenda? You need to see where your information is coming from. It cannot be trusted. So, you know, and you'll see my book is referenced. Uh, I mean, none of that stuff's just thumbs up. Every comment is is referenced there. I mean, I, I mentioned in my book about just turning your head and dying. And that is actually a phenomenon called Eagle Syndrome from having prolonged style of hired processes that touch your corroded receptors and cause an inca, which is an instantaneous neurogenic cardiac effect. It sounds bizarre, yet there is a case study in a reputable journal about Eagle syndrome. A few weeks ago, I placed a post on social media asking for questions that you would like to ask a forensic pathologist. And now we're going to get into some of those questions. Megan Repko would like to know, what's the weirdest or craziest thing you've ever seen? Okay, well, I like the way she asked the question because we, get, we frown upon people asking what's the most interesting thing you've ever seen. You know, we don't find other people's unnatural deaths interesting. However, if they do ask it in that format, you know, what's the most unusual thing you've ever seen, then you can, I suppose, answer it. So... I think it was quite respectful in the way that she posed her question. And the answer is in my book. Um, it's the, to me, it still remains the story of the giant African rat. Um, we, and we've seen some unusual stuff inside bodies, but Megan would have to buy the book and read that. Lynn schmalz would like to know, how can I kill someone and get away with it? <laughs> And the answer to that, Lynn, is pray Ryan Blumenthal is not doing the autopsy. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I would be going against Health Professions Council uh, guidelines to put out some, such information. You know, and every year, just as an interest, you know, we ask people, what do you think is the perfect murder? And what surprises and astounds me is how many people have actually thought about this. You know, and I, I do discuss this in the book, uh, you know, and... Forensic science is now so good that um, it will generally leave a trace and you can find it um, after a thorough investigation. So, um, and with programs like CSI, etc., I mean, you, you know what the public knows in a way. I, I use a metaphor in my book about a magician trying to fool a spectator, you know, and there are known methods. So, for example, if a magician is trying to fool another magician, it will be very difficult because that magician knows those methods. And I know there's this program called Pen and Teller Fool Us. So if they really do fool the magician, it must be extraordinary special to, to be able to fool someone. Or it may be a normal trick being shown to a layman. So I think it's, it's a way of thinking. Um, and uh, I use that metaphor in the book to, to explain the, the theoretical difference or process between the two. Monique Nordia would like to know, what is the strangest piece of evidence that pulled a case together for you? Um, that is also in the book. I had a, a good luck charm that cracked open an international syndicate. Um, it was, but that you'll read in the book. Roxy Piper would like to know, what are the determining factors that ascertain foul play over natural or self-inflicted causes in seemingly clear-cut investigations? Okay, well, that is what I discuss in the book. There's no such thing as seemingly clear-cut. I think I discussed the concept of premature closure, which is a fallacy of reasoning almost. 
you know, you think you see something and you just assume this is a hanging and then you switch off. That is a, a fatal mistake you can make in the field. But there's no such thing as clear cut. You know, how much evidence do you need before you call it? So, for example, if I see something macroscopically on the liver, do I just call it? Or do I now do histology to confirm it? And then once I've done histology, do I go deeper and do immunohistochemistry to confirm that? And then do I go even deeper and do electron microscopy to confirm that? And how much evidence do you need to actually call something to say that it is what it is? And then it once again comes down to resources. How much resources can you throw at this? How much money can you throw at this before you call it? And marie Bloomer would like to know, how does it feel to have a big part in determining if someone is guilty or innocent? Well, once again, it's a team effort. I do not take any um, you know, ego or kudos for myself being the sole determinant in, in solving the crime. It's, it's always a team effort. And that's why the book is dedicated to those practicing forensics in Africa. Um, there are unsung heroes, and this is what the book is dedicated to. But um, just to answer the question, it is one of the best feelings in the world. It is intangible. Um, it is not something like monetary, you know, that can... Uh, catching a bad person is one of the most intangible feelings. It's indescribable. And I guess probably even more so for you on a personal level. Because this is the whole reason you got involved in forensic pathology, is to bring justice to these victims. Yes. And it's about anti-bullying again, and it's about uh, speaking for those that cannot speak for themselves, and I too have been a victim of crime, and you know, it's, it's like, it's al almost vigilante type of thing on a scientific and higher level. Jeannie Herselman would like to know, which case still keeps you up at night, and why? Um, past relationships keep me awake at night. Those are the main things that keep me awake at night. Uh, work is work. And Candace Alexander didn't want to ask you a question, but she said, I wouldn't ask him anything. I would just say thank you for helping to make this world a little safer for my son to grow up in. Well, all of us in the forensic field, not just me, but uh, thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about the book or the writing or publishing process? Well, the book took me about six years to write and people are devouring it in two days. So it feels like a fine wine or a fine whiskey that's been aging for years and then tragically is drunk in one session. That, that's what it feels like. It, it was a lot of hard work to write this down and to sanitize it and to um, dilute it in a way that um, wouldn't offend anyone. I had to try and de-identify cases as much as possible. It was a hard, hard uh, job to write this. So I'm feeling quite spent here after this process. Wow, that's quite a process. But I think it's also understandable because it's really detailed. I also read it in two or three days, I think. But I think that's a testament to the fact that you've made this pretty intense subject, something that the public can easily enjoy reading and therefore it will probably be read by more people. And one of my hopes is that people will reread it. And, um, you know, if I can also just tell you, you know, some of the books that have inspired me, uh, I was very impressed by a book from 1952 called The Story of San Michel, written by Axel Munte, which is about a doctor in the time of cholera. And, you know, we are now doctors in the time of, you know, HIV, AIDS and COVID. So that uh, book r really resonated deeply with me. I've read that book about six times. I believe it's a classic of literature and I, I cannot um, support that book uh, strongly enough. Well, I can tell you for sure that I will be using your book as a reference for my own research in this podcast. No, look, I'm, I'm quite uh, satisfied that I've... Uh, got this all off my chest. Uh, I wrote from the heart. Um, it was cathartic in a way, therapeutic in another way. I'm happy this information is out there. I hope to achieve that people can take this kind of thinking into their own lives. Uh, in the book, for example, I give 10 uh, sagely pieces of advice 
to try and uh, make the world a safer and a better place. And I just believe that if people stick to those 10 like rules or laws, they, they shouldn't end up on our table. You know, and it's basic things. They'll have to read it in the book, but it's like, do not tempt fate. Care more about yourself. Care more about others. Do not overindulge. Do not travel fast. You know, there's basic things there that, uh, you know, if you just stick to those, you technically should not end up on a forensic autopsy table. And that's another thing that sets your book apart for me compared to other books I've read in the genre. Because you didn't just approach it from a clinical perspective. The care and empathy that you have for your patients was evident in the fact that you provide advice on how not to end up on your autopsy table. I think you did a phenomenal job, Ryan. I really do. Thanks, Nicole. Ryan Blumenthal's book, Autopsy, Life in the Trenches with a Forensic Pathologist in Africa, is available online at Take a Lot and Loot, and also in all good bookstores. It is a truly fascinating book and a must-have for anyone with interest in this field. I'd like to thank Ryan Blumenthal for taking the time to chat to me, as well as Jonathan Ball Publishers for arranging the interview. I am truly grateful for the opportunity to talk to these fascinating people, and in doing so, I hope to provide information that helps us not only better understand the cases we talk about on the podcast, but also to just increase our general knowledge levels, which I think is super important. This was a bonus episode that I released, as I didn't want to hold on to this awesome content, but I will be back on Friday with your full case episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. <laughs>